Hello! Crossing the river by feeling the stones. Um, I better tell you where we're going today. I'm going to start off talking about the subject of strategy, after which we're heading south. I'm going to talk about situational awareness. Anybody here with a military background? No one? Go on, shout out. Ooh, good, right, excellent, super. After that, we're going to talk about maps and why they matter. Uh, then I'm going to talk about patterns in economic cycles before we finally finish uh, talking about serverless. How many of you are into serverless? Go on, woo, or, or boo, or whatever. Right, we'll, we'll get there soon. Okay, so we're going to talk about the issue of strategy. I'm going to take you way back in time, uh, back to 2005, when I was CEO of this company. It was called Fatango. It was an online photo service. We had about 16 different lines of business, very profitable. Um, but it had a really big problem. And the problem was this chap, uh, the CEO, uh, because... The CEO was a fake CEO. They were making it up as they went along. And I knew this because I was the CEO. So rather than being sort of a chess playing master, I was the alchemist. It was all, you know, gut fill, whatever's popular in the HBR, Harvard Business Review. Um, we had vision statements. So this is our vision statement from 2003. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. But the problem is I'd pinch that from someone else and just changed a few words. Now, I was a little bit concerned that people would rumble that I didn't know what I was talking about. So I went around recording other CEOs talking about strategy and I would record the words they would use. I called them business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. I do this every couple of years. Uh, this was 2014, the common BLAS, uh, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, blah, blah, blah. If I did it today, what would you hear? <laughs> Cloud native, mm, okay. <laughs> Bit of blockchain over there. <laughs> yeah, I think we even had a bit of machine learning going on over here. So anyway, so what I did is I, I, I grabbed all these company strategies documents together and created a blah template. Our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I combined the blahs and the blah templates together and auto-generated 64 strategies at random. Oh, I'd stop clapping. We're going through them. Right. <laughs> Number one. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. Number two, <laughs> 64. <laughs> our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use... I can barely say the words. It's that awful. Um, but I sent them around... And I got basically 400 responses, three basic types. Number one, this is the exact wording from our business plan. Uh, number two, I've seen two of these used already. And the third, and my favorite, is are you for hire? <laughs> so anyway, a friend of mine's put this all online. Uh, this is strategy as a service. <laughs> so if you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL. It will automatically generate you one based upon nothing whatsoever. Um, if you don't like it, it's really simple. Just press refresh. Uh, so I started to suspect I might not be the only one making it all up. So I went back to first principles, started with uh, Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? Art of War. Right, super. Talks about five factors that mattered in competition. One, understand your purpose. Two, understand the landscape you're competing in. Three, understand the climactic patterns that influence the landscape. 
Four, understand doctrine, your principles of organization. And five, you get into the leadership bit, which is all about where to attack, etc. So I came across John Boyd. Anybody heard of John Boyd? Ooda Loops, fantastic, US Air Force pilot. Uh, so he created what was called the Ooda Loop. So you have the game, the purpose. Your next step is to observe the environment. That's the first O. Um, that's landscape and climactic patterns. Uh, then you orientate around this, that's doctrine, and decide where you're going to attack, and then you act. And I was quite excited by this, and I would show it to others. And they would go, it doesn't matter. Strategy is all about the importance of why. Now, the interesting thing is there are two whys. There's the why of purpose, as in I want to do something. And there's the why of movement, as in the choices I make. So for example, a game of chess, your why of purpose might be to win the game. Your why of movement is, do I move this piece or that piece? And it's through moving and action that we actually learn. So I went back to uh, my company for Tango, 16 lines of business, very profitable, revenue growing, CEO doesn't know what I'm doing. We have a purpose, well, it was a bit of a mess, uh, but I knew it was a cycle, so we could get better with this over time. So how did I understand or observe the landscape? Now, that brought me to my second subject, which is situational awareness. So I'll give you two examples. We'll start with Vikings, very frightening people. This is how Vikings used to navigate. They used to use stories. You'd spend you know, 10 years learning your epic story before you were put in charge of a boat. So from Herman, head towards uh, west towards half, that basically means that. So quick question, what would you use to navigate? Visual map or a verbal story? Uh, I'm, a bit under, I'm a bit undecided. What do we think we use in business? Stories, right, super. So another example is the Battle of Thermopylae. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. Persians were invading, 170,000 odd Persians. What he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road into a narrow pass called Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. Now, there are about 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans, right, you know the story. So I want you to imagine you're part of the Athenian army. It's the eve of battle. I'm giving you purpose. I'm Themistocles. And I say to you, I don't understand the landscape. I don't understand the environment. I don't have a map. But have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. Strength, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, we're Athenian, we hate the Spartans. And uh, threats the Persians, get rid of us, and the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. <laughs> okay, so what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Uh, position and movement described by a map or a magic framework like a SWOT. Position and, position and movement, yes, right. What do you think we use in business? <laughs> SWOT. SWOT, yes, excellent, super. So if I go back to chess versus alchemy, uh, look at navigation, learning, and strategy, then chess is all visual, context-specific, it's all about position and movement. It's what we call a high-level situational awareness environment. It's a bit like the military. If you ask a general, why, do they, why did you bomb a hill? They won't say, because I read an article in General Weekly that bombing hills was the latest thing. Uh, they won't say, this consultant gave me a report saying 67% of other generals are bombing hills, so I should <laughs> bomb a hill. Uh, they won't say, um, because that's what Uber would do. Um, <laughs> it's all about position and movement. Um, now, business isn't. It's all about magic frameworks. And we love our secrets of success. This is my favorite Harvard Business Review, uh, how earlobes can signify leadership potential uh, from November 2011. It's uh, phrenology of management. 
Anyway, so alchemy is all about storytelling, secrets of success, magic frameworks, uh, low-level situational awareness environment. That's where I was as this fake CEO, and that's I wanted to be over there. Now, the difference between these two environments is the existence, non-existence of a map, which brings me to my third subject, which is maps. So what makes a map? Well, maps have certain characteristics. They're visual, they're context-specific. This is a battle of Thermopylae, not the Battle of Waterloo. You have an anchor, in this case a compass. You have the position of pieces, and you have consistency of movement. So if I want to go from Thebes to Athens, which way would I go? South? Southeast-ish, yes, right. So if I headed off from Thebes, went southeast, and ended up in Thermopylae, what would that tell me? That either the map's wrong or the compass is wrong. Perfect, right. So what I had in business, however, were diagrams like this, systems maps. Ever seen one of these? Right. I'm going to highlight CRM, Customer Relationship Management. I'm going to move it over there. So if they are flicked between the two. How has that changed the map? Nothing, right. If I take an atlas and I shift, say, Australia and put it next to Copenhagen, does that change the map? Yes. So it doesn't change this map because, unsurprisingly, um, this is not a map. Um, in maps, you see space have meaning. Now, we have loads of things uh, in business we call maps. Business process maps, uh, uh, mind maps, and they all have one characteristic in common which is, they're not maps. We keep on using that word, and I'm afraid it doesn't mean what we think it means. So how to map? So I took a systems diagram. First thing I had to do was give it an anchor. So in this case, I started with the customer as the anchor, focus around the user need. Then you have to have position. So I organized the components in a chain of needs. Customer needs this, this needs that, this needs that. So I've now got anchor and position. Lastly, I need movement. And the way I dealt with movement was to add an evolution access, because there's a common pattern by which things evolve. We start with the genesis of the novel and new, custom-built examples, products and rental services, commodity and utility services. And that was the first map I produced in 2005. And in this map, space has meaning. So I was quite excited, showed it to others, and they all went, so what? That brings me to patents. Right, once you can understand the landscape, you can start to observe climactic patterns. And there's around 30 common climactic patterns. These are the rules that influence the game. I'll give you a few. Everything evolves. If there's supply and demand competition, it shifts from left to right. Number two. As things evolve, their characteristics change. Doesn't matter whether it's money, penicillin, or computing. Starts off in this uncharted space, chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, ends up becoming industrialized. Because of this, you have another pan that there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all methods. We'd gone all agile, extreme programming in 2002. By 2004, we had realized it doesn't work everywhere. Extreme program, agile in-house, very good on the left. Six Sigma, outsourcing, very good on the right. Lean, very good in the middle. Because one, you're focused on reducing cost of change, one, you're focused on learning, and one, you're focused on reducing deviation. The next pattern we learned is we had inertia to change because of past success. So Blockbuster, Netflix, who was first with the website? Blockbuster, who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, great. Who was first with experimenting with video streaming? Blockbuster, great. Who went bankrupt first? <laughs> Blockbuster, great. It's not because they couldn't innovate. They out-innovated everyone. They had inertia created by their existing business models. So now, once you learn these patterns, I've shown you a few, you can start to anticipate the obvious. So in 2005, we knew platform and compute was going to a utility. We knew we'd have inertia. We knew this would enable people to build new and novel things on top. And so that gave us multiple points of attack where we could invest. 
The next set of patterns are doctrine. These are all about organizational structure, basic things like focusing on user needs, removing bias and duplication, and cell-based structures. There's about 40 of those. We'll skip that and get straight into the leadership bit. These are all about context-specific forms of gameplay, of which there are 70, at least 70. Well, actually, I know there's more than 70, but I'll publicly say 70. So what you've got is a map. You can anticipate where things are going. What we mean by context-specific forms of play is you can manipulate the market. You can use open approaches to drive things to a more industrialized state, fear, uncertainty, and doubt to slow it where there's inertia barriers. You can use constraints. There's all sorts of ways of manipulating the market. And so what you do with this is you come up with a context-specific form of gameplay. So what we did in 2005 is we realized that somebody else was likely to play the compute utility game. I thought it was going to be Google. So we decided to build the world's first ever uh, utility platform, a true serverless environment, uh, JavaScript front and back end with functional billing. And that's what we launched. Uh, because the next step is what you do is you act, and that changes your purpose and the landscape. And we launched something called Zimki. And it grew like hotcakes. People were building entire applications in a single language, front and back, with functional uh, billing to the function, all exposed through APIs. Unfortunately, um, the parent company had a big consultancy come in and say the three things that we were doing, mobile phones as cameras, 3D printing, and cloud, were not the future. The future was, in fact, 3D television. So we should shut it all down and, and, um, and do 3D TV. And of course, uh, Amazon then launched, etc. Um, anybody here have a 3D TV? One, fantastic. Do you use it? No, right, OK, fine. <laughs> um, but it wasn't all lost, uh, because the point is I could use the maps, and we could learn, because it had the context, we'd go back and learn from them in a way that we didn't, I've never learned with SWOTs or business models. So at Ubuntu, because I knew Mark and I you know, joined Ubuntu. We mapped it all out in 2008, used the map to identify where to attack, spent about half a million. We were 2% of the operating system market, roughly. It took me 18 months, and we took 70% of all cloud. Do you remember that time where Ubuntu, nobody really heard of it, and then it was all over cloud? Anybody? Yep. Thank you. Uh, these days, I do mainly government stuff and nation-state competition, things like that. Right, so that brings me to the final bit, which is serverless. And I've got about two and a half minutes left. So we'll go through a trail through history. Compute. The early days, applications were built in hardware. Uh, plugs and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this evolved, and then we came up with custom-built examples like Leo, Lions Electronic Office. Uh, so we got applications, we got an operating system uh, built on compute. Uh, this all evolved. Uh, eventually, we got products like the IBM 650. Uh, so we got applications built on operating system, built on compute as a product. Now, one of the characteristics of compute as a product was high MTTR, high mean time to recovery. So when my server went bang, it would take me weeks, if not months, to get a new one. So we built lots of novel architectural practices, like disaster recovery test, M plus one, capacity planning. Do you remember all that gibberish? Good, right, super duper. And then that evolved, and uh, we created new tribes uh, around those sorts of practices, and we would laugh at anybody who, you know, what do you mean you ran out of space on your email server, something along those lines. Uh, of course, we got language frameworks, so now we had applications built on emerging coding practice on a language framework. All of that stuff was evolving, and it sort of ended up here, and we were all happy. Applications, best coding practice on a framework, on an operating system, best architectural practices on computers, a product. And then something really evil happened, which was cloud. That's the entire history of cloud, that dotted red line. All it means is we shifted from product to utility. But it has a big impact because it creates another pattern, which is known as co-evolution of practice. We went from high MTTR to low mean time to recovery, so not weeks, but seconds to create a new server. So suddenly, we can distribute systems, design for failure, continuous deployment, because we're not waiting for months for the server to turn up. 
Um, so every book, everyone got excited by cloud. Uh, uh, they got bored of earlobes. So basically, uh, CEOs ran around saying, make my stuff cloudy. Uh, people put their stuff onto Amazon. It had an outage. People would run around screaming, the end of cloud is nigh. Do you remember those days? Good, right, you would go, shouldn't our architecture evolve as well? They would go, burn him heretic. <laughs> Do you remember that? Good, right. Um, but nonetheless, these new practices were appearing. It was just we had inertia caused by the old practices. Uh, that would evolve, a new tribe would form. Uh, we gave it a name, DevOps. We would run around screaming, it's all about user needs, iterative uh, cycles, automation, etc. And the old tribe would go, so was I till. Um, so we'd go, burn him, heretic. <laughs> um, compute, obviously the operating system became more of a commodity, and now we're seeing the same with serverless. Shifting uh, code execution environments, going from a product stack to much more utility, and we're seeing the same co-evolution of practice, combining finance and development together. And of course, that will evolve. So that's the future, serverless and uh, the uh, combined emerging practices that are appearing. Uh, a new tribe is also forming there. Uh, everything else is the new legacy, to which people go, DevOps is the new legacy? Burn him, heretic. <laughs> OK. <laughs> To which we say, what about containers? Well, that's the entire um, uh, uh, the stack. Uh, uh, the stuff at the bottom becomes less visible, which basically means we, we don't care. I'm sorry. Uh, you need to move up the stack. That's where the real battle is. Uh, at the moment, there's a real danger uh, that we win the battle at the lower end stuff, and Amazon wins the uh, uh, we, they, they win the war and we lose the war. Um, Amazon, 70% of the serverless market, people are pretty much estimating it's dominating in that space. I know Kelsey and others have talked about it. We need to move up that stack. So very quick summary. Strashy, it's a cycle. Uh, it's really important to understand the landscape. It's an iterative process. It's really also important to act. And it, the entire talk it was summarized by one phrase by Deng Xiaoping, which is crossing the river by feeling the stones, purpose and direction, take small steps, adapt along the way. And at that point, I'll say thank you.